Potawatomi, arts, culture, and entertainment. This is a Pace production. Without any further ado, I give you Andy Peters talking about a closer look at history of painting drawing. Thanks, Adam. I'm going to show you some, um, some before and after pictures tonight to give you a sense of how long ago all of these drawings took place. And as an example, when, if you can imagine this theater um, a year and a half ago when it was still under construction, that's not an easy thing to imagine, but I was actually privileged to go on a tour with my friend Tom Whitson, who's a pillar of this community and has donated um, countless, literally thousands of hours to making Counts of Left's a better place. He said to me, as we talked about these George Simons drawings, he said, he said, we must be reminded of our history and we have a very rich history. And he said a real mouthful because the immigrant trail came through here, and that would include the California Trail, the Oregon Trail, and also the Mormon Trail. They all sort of constricted right here at this point, and many famous people were involved that we will learn more about. But to show you as an example, you try and imagine with me, if you will, what this looked like a year and a half ago, and that gives you a better idea. So this is what George Simon's drawings will do for us, trying to imagine Council Bluffs, Iowa, and Pottawatomie County 150 years ago. Now try and imagine what this looked like where we're at right now, this spot, 200 years ago. And it looked like that for t hundreds of thousands of years. So we will see kind of the, um, the assembling of this town of Counts of Luffs. And our artist's name is George Simons. And this is part one of a two-part series. This is an iconic view of Counts of Bluffs, um, St. Uh, Peter's Catholic Church on Bluff Street. And actually, I'm showing you this because there was a view up there that used to be available. The ridge on that bluff used to be about where the ridge line is on the roof of the church. And so, with the help of Kent Hertz, who is a sound engineer, he's an artist here in a, in a studio, he's running the Facebook Live right now, tonight, from a camera at the back of the house. He flew his drone up a little bit higher than that roof, and if you look down from the right, you would look into a view of Council Bluffs that looks like that today, a couple weeks ago. Now imagine, if you will, what that looked like 170 years ago. A frontier town, a single street straggling up through the century block of Broadway and surrounded on both sides by these beautiful bluffs and at the end of that street where Broadway Methodist is now the Ocean Wave Saloon jutted out into the east end of the north end of that Broadway of the century block of Broadway it was a casino and a saloon and a gambling house that was really wild because this particular drawing was done of Council Bluffs right around 1850 when all of the gold rush fanatics were headed for California. The 49ers were coming through. In the background, we can see a couple of buildings on a hillside, and those are the old fort and blockhouse and mission. This, these were the, the, the building on the left um, is the old blockhouse, and that was the very first building built in Council Bluffs. A Captain Moore and his detachment came in. They needed to protect the Potawatomi Indians who were about to arrive. The Potawatomis would live right in that part of town. And today, that would be this location where State Street comes down and joins East Broadway. It was said that that particular blockhouse actually, and fort, and mission, existed about 50 feet above the grade. That was, a very, that was a very large bluff there that came all the way to Indian Creek. Broadway sat and the historian in 1915 said when he was a kid that those ruins were almost directly overhead, 50 feet above you. Very good place to build a fort, obviously. So here's the sketch in its, ent in its entirety. And this was the kind of thing that George Simons was doing. He could draw in perspective. He drew each and every building that he could see from sitting up on his bluff. 
we can see at the top of the picture there is a curving line of foliage that comes in from the upper left. That is Indian Creek right where it passes between the two hospitals, Jenny and Mercy. It has come out of the ravine where Hoover School is. And so we are able to see as a wilderness that there really isn't very much else up that ravine at that time. On the left, we can see the mill that was built in the 1840s by a fellow with the spectacular frontier name of Madison Dagger. Madison Dagger. And it was called Dagger's Mill. And we can see in another drawing that George Simons has done, after they've converted this mill from a grist mill for grinding grain to a sawmill where they could put a saw to work um, by the power of the water and saw logs into lumber for the first time. This would be like sort of the earliest version of Home Depot. You can, you can see a guy coming up there on a wagon. He's got his little dog, a team of two, and the fellow in within the mill, doubtless, is Madison Dagger himself with two lookers on. We can see the mill wheel and the water going over it. So he's very careful to capture all these details. He's capturing these drawings for his friend, the famous Grenville M. Dodge, who brought him here on a surveying trip together and saw the drawing talent that George Simons had. And at, the general, at Grenville Dodge's behest, he wasn't a general just yet, George Simons created these fabulous drawings. He, this is an example that shows the, the sort of torn edges of certain drawings. They were in a portfolio that was General Dodge's pride and joy. He would not part with these drawings for, for any amount of money and he was fond of bringing them out to show the famous visitors that came to the historic Dodge house where he lived. He and George Simons both immediately became essentially lifelong Council Bluffs residents starting in 1853. So what I've tried to do is show you that complete drawing with its torn edge and the little demarcation line, which probably indicates that this one was not a field sketch, but was more likely a drawing that was done from a field sketch because of its larger size. That particular mill was situated on the eponymous Mill Street and North 6th Street. That's that intersection. We're down in the Missouri River floodplain. We're looking where the bluff slopes right down to 6th Street below what was formerly Washington School. And that mill probably sat about like this at the intersection of what would become Mill. And it was on the west of Mill and 6th. It was on the west edge of the Mormon settlement because in the 1840s and early 1850s, this was almost demographically an entirely Mormon town at, at the time. One of the most important people at the time was a fellow by the name of Elder Orson Hyde, and he published a newspaper called The Frontier Guardian. This is a picture of his house. He was, one, he was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. They were the governing body after their leader, Joseph Smith, had been killed. And along with, elder, with, with Apostle Elder Orson Hyde, <coughs> excuse me, was also Brigham Young and some other very famous officers in the church. We can see a buck and rail fence that surrounds it and nothing but prairie on the hill behind. It was the first house built on what would become Washington Avenue. Today, that is East Canesville, Canesville Boulevard, and it is Elder Street, which runs down to meet Canesville at that point. Here's an early map of when the Mormons began to arrive here. They've been sort of driven out of Nauvoo, Illinois. They came here on a sort of forced march across Iowa, which was nothing but virgin prairie like the earlier slide that I showed. <clears throat> the population of Counts of Bluffs doubled and then some in 1847 when winter quarters was abandoned after a very difficult winter. Um, there were lots of Mormons who lived here and there were lots more that came over from winter quarters to a town that was then called Miller's Hollow. Not because of Dagger's Mill, by a fellow by the name of Miller. And we can also see that this was the point 
of the log tabernacle, which has been reconstructed today. This is the original version, but it's not a very good example of the work of George Simons because it was probably described to him. It, was, it had fallen into ruin by the time he got here. It only stood for two years, but it stood long enough. It was indeed built for the nomination of Brigham Young as the president of the Latter-day Saints Church going forward. And of course, Elder Orson Hyde would have been part of that. Um, and he was also, Brigham Young would have petitioned for the name change from his friend Thomas Kane from Miller's Hollow to Canesville. So there were many positive things that came out of the time that they, that they lived here um, in the late 1814s, early 1850s. The Grand Encampment was another very large Mormon settlement. And there were Mormons scattered all over the region because the, a directive from the church wanted them to farm. And they literally had thousands of acres in production because before they continued on, the 1,400 more miles to get to the Valley of the Great Salt Lake, which they would call New Zion, they had to have a certain amount of cornmeal and flour and other supplies with them. Counts of Bluffs or Canesville was where that would happen. Finally, in this map, I get a view of how Lake Manawa was formed. I always knew that it was an Oxbow Lake, but we can see that the river looped north there, came into the lake from the west side, and exited on the southeast. On the upper left, we can see the Middle Mormon Ferry. That would be at the South Omaha Bridge Road. And you can see that if you started on one side of the river, you ended up across the river much farther downstream because while we had among the first steam ferries, there were not steam ferries in those days. At the bottom is Sarpy's Point. Um, Peter Sarpy was, a, was an employee of the American Fur Company. He was a founder of Bellevue and a trader, and he did very much to help the Mormons when they arrived in a near starving and threadbare condition uh, when they first came in 1846. In a close-up view of our earlier drawing, we can see two Native Americans, probably Potawatomi, they could be Ottawa, uh, were the other people that, that came here with them at that time. And they are looking up Broadway as if witness to a vanishing frontier. And nearby we can see two more Native Americans, apparently in their favorite pastime of horse trading. And above them, there's a Native American with a rifle, with a long rifle on his shoulder. And above them, there are the antlers on the end of the ridge of a log cabin. I mean, this could be Deadwood, South Dakota, or Tombstone. It was just that much of a frontier town. If we look over on the left side, we can see a great number of covered wagons coming off of Broadway and into an open meadow just to the west of Dagger's Mill. These would be this would be a Mormon wagon train that's come across from the east. They would be under the direction of Elder Orson Hyde, who was coordinating all of this. Runners would come to him, or he would send out runners in other directions to help accommodate these people. We can see beyond them that other people have already gone into camp and turned their stock out. And then also at the bottom between the campers, we can see what appears to be an elk or maybe a deer, or some other kind of animal. And then, you know, I, please, if there's somebody in the audience that could help me, that maybe that you know the story of the elk in the, in the paddock in 1849, they don't make good pets. Uh, you know, and this is a big, this one is obviously a number of years old. It doesn't make any sense, but I promise you that if, if George Simons painted it, it was there. It, it, it's really a, a complete um, head scratcher for me. But these would then go under the supervision of General Dodge, of, of Grenville M. Dodge, who was, who, who was encouraging and funding this artist to do these beautiful drawings. And he might say, well, George, you know, we, there was more people, was, that was a bigger caravan going in. Or how about the Native Americans? They were still around then. So, it was the combination of the two of them. It wasn't just George Simons. It was George Simons and Grenville Dodge together were responsible for what is this record before photography that's essentially historically impeccable, that we can trust it implicitly. 
This is the entire sketch. It's 17 and a half inches wide, which means that this is probably a studio version, but there are other versions of this view from his bluff, which I call artist's bluff now. The bluff has been carved away somewhat. But uh, they would lead to this painting, which generously was donated to Pace to go along with these drawings for the exhibition that is on extended stay upstairs in our gallery. Canesville, 1851. 17 by 24 inches. We can look up the century block. We can see the Ocean Wave Saloon at the end of the street. We can see the old fort and blockhouse up on the upper right. We can see the Mormons going into camp and even the Native Americans camp in conjunction with them. Uh, to me, this is incredibly exciting. I can imagine being a kid and walking around in a frontier town like this with all these interesting things going on. People coming from far away, people outfitting to keep moving onward. And in the center of this picture, we can see the Pacific House Hotel, which was opened by Samuel Bayless in 1853. And in front of it is a stagecoach with a four-in-hand team. And to the left of the Pacific House Hotel is obviously a livery barn where travelers can, can board their horses for the night or where the stagecoach driver can board his team. It was on the porch of this Pacific House Hotel where Grenville Dodge and Abraham Lincoln would meet a few years later. At that particular meeting, Grenville Dodge would convince Abraham Lincoln that this was absolutely the eastern terminus for the, for the Transcontinental Railroad. And that continuing on up the Platte River and onto the Pacific Ocean, Omaha would be the best starting place, not Nebraska City, not the mouth of the Platte. And there was powerful lobbies in favor of both of those. So it was on the porch of the Pacific House Hotel. So just who was Grenville Dodge at that time besides a friend of Abraham Lincoln's and his friend George Simons? They had both come from Streeter, Illinois and Grenville Dodge had won the contract to be the primary surveyor for the Rock Island Railway across the wilderness that was Iowa. And about halfway across the state one evening, the survey party goes into camp and the camp cook, George Simons, has pencil and paper and he does this drawing which General Dodge sees the drawing and says you know that is a fabulous document about what's going on on our shared wilderness adventure and if you would continue to do drawings I will purchase them from you and I will make a book out of them I will make a portfolio so the writing in the bottom of the drawing 1853 is the handwriting of George Simons Perhaps the writing on the right as well. We can see a huntsman. We can see a fellow lifting a buck deer on a fulcrum. We can see the wrangler's horse tied to a wagon wheel. The other livestock has been loosed from their harness and turned out to roll and to graze. But the wrangler's horse has to keep working. This is, this is the oldest thing in horse management on the range. That the other horses turned out are double hobbled or maybe even loose herded but they're gonna be brought back in at night and put on a tie line and the wrangler's horse will remain like this until that. He'll get his chance to graze and to roll. There's a fellow that's cooking dinner in a kettle over a fire, probably George Simons. He's the camp cook. There's split firewood at his feet. Behind him, there is a surveyor's transit and a grade stake laying on the ground. Ahead of him, next to the wagon, there's a grub box, and by the wagon tongue, we can see the harness removed from the team that's been dropped in place next to the tongue. So all of these details are things that you might read about somewhere, but to see them, you know, with your own two eyes like this is to bring the entire situation to life, to be in that camp. Here's another version of it. The hunter on the right may have actually been hired by the expedition to, for the 
purpose of providing protein for all the workers. There certainly weren't, there weren't any settlements of any kind at that time in the central part of the state, except for a couple of what, three waypoints that the Mormons had created from Nauvoo to help their straggling faithful get through their arduous journey. But if we look at this closely, we no longer see the split firewood at the feet of the cook, another view of George Simon's most likely. We no longer see the grade stake at the, at the bottom of the tripod. And we don't see the harness next to the wagon tongue. So it's the sketch oftentimes while you're out there that captures the real truth of the situation. And sometimes studio versions don't quite match up. I'm um, um, impressed that in the, 18th cent or in the 19th century that so frequently um, the great things that happened in this country required lengthy expeditions and all the inconvenience and discomfort of camping out. Take Lewis and Clark, for example. They kicked off the whole century with the, with the great camp out. And so artist friends and I do this on an annual basis and we go out west to try and recapture some of the feeling that pioneer artists before us had done when they traveled, for example, in the Wind River Mountains. So to this day, together we set up our easels, we paint wilderness peaks so far into the back country that they don't even have names. We get to see that country as those men saw it from the, from the back of a horse, from, like Native Americans saw it, like mountaineers saw it. And so we get to experience also, thankfully, a digital Sabbath of at least 10 days. You know, I, there's no connectivity up there. So think, you know, so remember that before you take the kiddos on a 10 year pack trip, on a 10 week, or a 10 day pack trip. I don't know how, if they might appreciate it quite as much as I do, but um, it's a fabulous thing and it really helps to put this 19th century experience together. Another drawing that was done much closer to here with the, ex, with the survey crew was done at Crescent City. And in the background, that would be Crescent, Iowa, I believe. That's as nearly as we can figure out. That's exactly where it is. On the right hand, we can see the fellow holding the grade stake. On the left, um, above the Native American, we can see the surveyor on the transit. And in between, we can see the measuring chain as they begin, their, as they're making a survey, uh, basically across the continent. And the fellow on the, that's sitting down and smoking the pipe may very well be Grenville M. Dodge, who would have been along on that. We can see horses that are tied. We can even see their little feed trough at the back of the covered wagon. I presume that's what that is, but I don't know what, that for sure. I, it's, it's, not a, it's not a planter, it's, um, but I like these horses and I've used them in the back country a lot and I like to see them portrayed. He, he drew them carefully. Indeed, for my own purposes in painting in different places that are difficult and interesting and have been sequestered from the modern world, I go there for the simple expedient of, of seeing people who are still living a 19th century lifestyle. This could have been in or around Council Bluffs in the 19th century. It's a husband and wife working side by side in a race against winter. That's exactly what the Mormon people were doing. Or a beautiful team of bay horses with tasseled halters pulling a mountain of hay, fodder for the winter time. To still see these things and be around them is to sort of step back into the 19th century and I paint them as well as the organic rural architecture that's also endangered in these places like the Ukraine and Siberia and Eastern Europe where things like this can still be found. Scenes from my great grandfather's time when men and horses were partners in work every day. And the local taxi driver whose horse still has ice cleats on his shoes from the winter, although it is early spring, obviously. This is another drawing from the same view on top of the bluff. 
it's, a, it's later than the first one. Now it's, it's in the late 1850s, and we can see three-story buildings with windows and flat roofs. We can see Dagger's Mill is steer, still there. And that would lead to this painting, which generously was loaned to us by the Council Bluffs Public Library. Um, really my first exposure to George Simon's work. And immediately I realized when I saw that painting that there were fabulous things going on and important information blanks that were filled in. Can anyone uh, tell me what the name of that big red brick building in the middle is with the mansard roof? The Ogden Hotel. I think now there's a, it's called Ogden Place is where that used to stand. And so we've seen a panoramic view now of around 1860. We can see there's public transportation. In the center of the picture, in the lower left there, is a trolley. It's drawn by a team of two. It's heading up Broadway. It's in the century block. In the leafy, in the leafy neighborhood that's beyond the, the red brick building, that's the base of Harrison Street. It used to be called Duck Hollow. And just above the trolley, I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but there is a girl in a red dress walking up the sidewalk. So there's interesting information of all kinds. Oh, and on the right-hand edge, just in front of the hotel, is the livery barn. It just is a livery stable where all these people who stand at the hotel put up all their horses back in the day. But that red brick building in there now is still standing today on that corner at the foot of the century block. up on the hill to the left um, are very small white marks at the top center near the ridge line. Those would be the very first headstones in Fairview Cemetery. Somewhere between those headstones and that sort of reservoir looking construction would be where the Black Angel is located today. And those prairie hills were now beginning to grow trees on them now that Native Americans were not burning off the winter grass and killing the saplings and that bison and elk were no longer grazing there. In the top left hand you can see a loop of the Missouri River with the hills of Nebraska beyond. Between that loop of river and the bluff there is a lake there and that would be what would become Big Lake Park. That was an oxbow, a former channel of the river. And this is a view of it that is extremely rare. We can see Big Lake Park today, but we didn't know that, uh, how it looked from literally downtown Council of Lus. The same view from up on the drone, looking out past that grain elevator, shows us Epley Airfield and the Nebraska skyline beyond. This is the painting in its entirety. It's, it's extremely valuable. It's five feet wide. It's, you know, kind of his magnum opus. He did some other things as well, but uh, regarding this side of the river, his work in Counts of Bluffs, he would go on to do paintings in places like Bellevue and Florence and Omaha and Elk City, and that, oh, by the Elkhorn. And so those will be part of the next presentation about his work when that uh, is completed. If you can imagine being up by Mercy Hospital now and looking the other direction, you can see a great wide expanse beyond the farthest buildings. And that was the floodplain from 12th Street to the river, about 24 blocks of flat marshy ground that would often flood in June when the meltwater came out of the Rocky Mountains. You couldn't live there. You couldn't build there. This is looking more south, down into downtown, and we can see that he's even penciled in the name of the People's Store, which was one of our early department stores, maybe our only department store when I was growing up, and it was very well known. 
It was run by a reputable family and they had pretty much everything and the stores did in those days. And it, those sketches would inform this painting, which is also on loan to us, thankfully, from the Counts Bluffs Public Library. We can see the People Store once again, and in that other sign up above where it says the People Store, there's an archaean set of symbols that I think would, would indicate the Mason's Lodge or the International Order of Odd Fellows. I don't, I don't know, but there were men's organizations back then, and that was their insignia. And far to the west, we can see the actual Missouri River from downtown, from what they called Hospital Hill, which is now where Mercy is located. We can see Washington Avenue, and we can still see the, the home of Elder Orson Hyde, although by this time, a uh, directive from Brigham Young sent him to Carson City, Nevada with an enormous wagon train of the faithful. And that house stood for a long time, and it shows prominently in sketches and in paintings, and I have to wonder if maybe um, he wasn't um, a favorite of Grenville Dodge's, or at least the impact that he had on the community. He, there was very little, if any, overlap between the two here. And there's the painting in its entirety. And in the back center, you can see the bluff where George Simons would choose to sit when he did the very first drawings and paintings that we saw. A painting that is not as tall today as it was, but it still can be from the steeple in the back center. You can see where that bluff still rises fairly prominently there. There's a modern picture juxtaposed over the painting. Back to this map, there was another mill that was actually the first mill built here by the chiefs of the Potawatomi tribe. It was called the Indian Mill and it was out off of Railroad Avenue on Mosquito Creek. And so this is where the Potawatomi people would go to have their corn ground into meal. And we see it now listed as Wicks Mill some years later. And we can see Mosquito Creek is kind of squiggling along, curves around it to the west. And here's a view of it in kind of a panoramic drawing of two sheets that have been joined together. Stutely Wicks and his Potawatomi wife and their child are featured here. We can see his livestock and his home. So obviously Grenville Dodge thought this was also very important, very worthwhile, worth something worth having a permanent record made of because in the rapidly changing times and technology of even then, of even their days. One of the things that strikes me about this, and this is another version of the same scene, is look how that stream is flowing up at grade. Look at how it's flowing at the level of the meadow itself as if it's meandering through the grass. Something like this is what it looked like. Well, today what it looks like is this. It's in the bottom of a gulch 60 or 70 feet below grade. That's the way the rivers and creeks are around here for the simple reason that back in the time of George Simons, the, the surrounding hills were covered with prairie and that acted like a sponge for rain that fell. But when the prairie was turned, and crops were farmed, then oftentimes water would run off in the furrows between. It would come down in larger volumes at a faster rate and, and create this kind of erosion. So we can see the then and the now very well. He provides us a view of what was. And even later, the same location would be called Parks Mill, another name that it went by. These are all Mormon people that have gathered for a festivity mostly because they've gathered their supplies and they're ready to head west. We don't have this painting. I don't know the whereabouts of this painting. I found this reproduction. But it shows Mosquito Creek at Parks Mill, which was formerly Wicks Mill, which was before that, the Indian Mill. And we can see these people and they're about to head west. But what they have to do is get across the Missouri River, which they're pretty anxious to do. They've been persecuted. Not everybody likes them, and the farther west they get, the happier they are. So once they've farmed for a year or two and build up their stores, and they're ready to go, the way that they get across the Missouri River is on a steamboat. So here are all of these Mormon people on the Nebraska side at Florence, basically where the Mormon bridge is located. But the captain of the steamboat is not going to take your livestock with him, not on his steamboat. And I really 
like horses and mules a lot, but I'm not going to get in a rowboat with them, especially hooked to a wagon. I mean, the, po the, the potential for disaster here is astonishing because, you know, they, can, they say that horses are afraid of two things, things that move and things that don't. <laughs> So if one of them gets a little squirrely and like stands on his head, the whole outfit goes over the way I see it. But you know, nobody has ever, ever shown us a picture of this. Now they had steam ferries later, and they even had a steam ferry, but that's loading hitched animals onto a thing that's belching fire and smoke and blowing a whistle. I mean, I, those kinds of things I enjoy contemplating for whatever reason. And then if you didn't have livestock, then you went west with the faithful and your family with a handcart. And this astounding picture shows us that reality in a way that no other picture has ever shown us before. We are privileged, we are repeatedly allowed into the world that they lived in, a world which was treacherous and difficult. They were so, um, um, people were unfriendly enough to them sometimes that they actually traveled on the north side of the Platte River. <clears throat> the Immigrant Trail primarily, the California and the Oregon Trail were on the south side of the Platte. <clears throat> the advantage of the north side was they were all together as a faith and that there was better pasturage, but there was a long detour to get up to the crossing on the Loop River. But um, they managed it. Here's another. These drawings are from the Omaha side. And tonight's presentation is about the Council Bluff side. But I wanted to give you a sneak preview of what will is still up ahead sometime next year when we can get the theater and uh, we can have this gathering in, in proper numbers. A beautiful drawing of, of Omaha in its earliest days, which started uh, about 20 years after Council Bluffs because that was a reservation there. And so more fabulous things from George Simons uh, in that next installment. In closing, I only have about a, just a handful of images to show, but I wanted to take a moment to say thank you uh, to Pace for allowing us the use of this gorgeous theater, the Bob and Polina Schlott Theater, um, what a magnificent organization this is for this community. Great artists, musicians, and singers, and performers, and chefs, and painters, and sculptors, and potters. They will come from here, and they will go to other places in the world, and they will talk about how they came up in Council of Loves because they have this really fabulous facility, and, and that's for kids of all ages, up to my age and beyond. So it's a marvelous thing for the community, and we had people that worked very hard on it um, to get it this far and, and uh, I look forward to when uh, all the performances are, are allowed to fill the theater once again. So for this opportunity, uh, thank you and for your kind attendance tonight, thank you very much, it's been a real treat. In this particular picture, we can see Hart's Trapping Station listed and Minster Springs. And this is a, 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 a map I could, I've been trying to imagine my whole life and it shows Iowa Lake, which was the old channel to the river, which would become Big Lake Park. Here, I've, in that blue portion, that is where the river used to run hard up against the bluffs. And then what would happen is some huge flood would come down the river, and then when that kind of went down again, the river channel might have moved. It might be found in a different place. And that's exactly what happened here the ravines of Minster Springs and DeLong Avenue came together. And the great thing about that bluff was you were in the uplands. You couldn't have a trapping station and a trading post in the floodplain. It would get washed away. So this was the first place that the river actually got along the bluffs for 100 miles downstream. You had to be practically to St. Joe before it was against the eastern bluffs. Uh, Captain Lewis and Clark commented on it in his journal from Lewis and, Lewis and Clark that this particular point was where the river could be against the east side, unusually. From the Lewis and Clark Monument, you can look down on the remnant of that oxbow called Big Lake Park. This portion, this large wetland scene here is not really commonly seen by a lot of people. It lays north of the park facilities for the, the improvements 
for the most part. But for me, it was the scene of a hundred childhood adventures with my friend Jimmy Schlott, who grew up at Minster Springs, with my brothers and our friends. We, any chance to get cold and muddy and wet, you know, you know how it is when you're that age. And we saw wonderful things that reminded us of the frontier, of what we'd heard about Lewis and Clark. And so that was a favorite place for us to go, and you can still see those things there today. It's still one of the things that has changed the least since the time of George Simons and the early days of Canesville. This is Hart's Bluff. It sits just north of the Lewis and Clark Monument. If you're sitting in the concourse, either concourse at Epley Airfield, you're looking right at this bluff. And you can see where the river hit the bluff and cut the face of it, and the yellow less clay is exposed. Well, this particular painting, this beautiful frontier painting, was done 20 years before George Simons arrived here by a frontier artist named Carl Bodmer. And Carl Bodmer was traveling in the company of a German scientist and military officer, an expedition leader, and, and a guy with money, and he hired this artist to go with him. And together, they would choose these scenes and these locations. And because of the oversight of the expedition leader, the artist's imperative for perfection was redoubled. And so his paintings, which are the crown jewel in the permanent collection of the Jocelyn Art Museum, are considered absolutely trustworthy in their accuracy. But it took the two of them in a team. And that, and I thought, you know, that's never going to happen again. That was a one-off event. That was synergy. That was a perfect example of synergy. That, that they were the original dynamic duo. And it could not ever happen again. Not for 20 years, anyway. <laughs> On the exact same spot. You see, it was the two men together that George Simons, they, they had this shared wilderness adventure that the artists looked up to the expedition leader, that together they were able to create this legacy. So now these drawings that came from General Grenville Dodge's collection eventually to the family of Vernell Laneson. I've been in touch. Her, her son, Craig Laneson, was a high school buddy of mine and his two siblings, Suzanne and Fred, I've, I've spoken with them recently. They kept these drawings for the last 40 years, which they inherited from their mother. They took very good care of them. Now we have sent them to the Ford Conservatory. They have been curated and stabilized and framed. They are in strong hands. They will inspire artists for generations to come. And for that we can thank Frontier artist, George Simons. Thank you. Andy, that was, uh, that was amazing. That's, I feel like it was like standing on a mountain looking down on this, but at the same time, like examining the fingerprints to understand the soul of the image. Wow, like, round of applause again, please. That, I got goosebumps at one point. So thank you. Um, thank you. So, I'm now here just to be with the microphone. If you have any questions, of course, I will run over to you. Liz. Did George Simons have any sort of uh, training, or is he just a self-taught artist? Did George Simons have any kind of training, or is he self-taught? I believe he was self-taught. Um, I don't know much about his life in the little town of Streeter, Illinois, where his neighbor, Grenville Dodge, was you know, his kind of uh, his, his mentor. But I don't know that, he, he was a little bit illiterate. We see on a lot of the drawings that words are misspelled badly. And that he, so he obviously was not highly educated, maybe second, third grade. So he, he was a natural talent. These are great questions, thank you. So Andy, I'm, I'm curious about the girl in the red dress. <laughs> <laughs> A real frontier town. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thanks again. Thank you.